couple of weeks ago, I reviewed Nothing's brand new entry-level device, the Nothing Phone 2A. But immediately following my time using that phone, rather than switching back to my go-to Android phone of choice right now, the Pixel 8 Pro, I thought that there was a super unique opportunity to instead switch back to the more flagship offering from Nothing, the Nothing Phone 2. And so that's exactly what I did. Not only to see how it compared to the Phone 2A, but also to see how things have evolved compared to the first time that I reviewed this phone. Now, I'm anticipating that Nothing will most likely release a successor to this phone sometime later this year. And so with that being said, we'll consider this video an updated nine month later and final review of the Nothing Phone 2. You ready? Let's dive in. Okay, to get things underway, I thought I'd start this video off by talking about the various software updates this phone has received since I last reviewed it. Probably the biggest talking point is that it did receive the big Android 14 update back in December, which was very much appreciated. But then along with that, nothing have also been pushing out regular quality of life updates pretty much every single month, all of which have just given me so much confidence in this clean yet still unique and distinguishable OS that nothing has been building. For example, Nothing has continued to add more of these first-party Nothing OS widgets, none of which I personally use, but I know a whole collection of people truly love the various Nothing OS widgets on offer. And so the fact that Nothing has continued to add to these is really cool. One of my favorite new features they added is this one that lets us hide app icons from the app drawer, which was a feature that I requested all the way back in my first review of the original Nothing Phone 1. So the fact that they did finally add it was something I was truly impressed by. Oh, and like what we saw on the Phone 2A, the Phone 2 did also get an update that included this AI wallpaper generation feature. And we also got these really handy atmosphere and glass effects that we can apply to any wallpaper we like. And both of these are fairly subtle features that most people aren't gonna be using every single day. But again, they're the sort of quality of life updates that you just love to see. Nothing did also finally add in its own inbuilt screenshot editor tool, which is hugely appreciated and which was also something that I mentioned back in my first review of the phone too. Plus, they also added a fix for that app draw swipe up fade to black issue that I mentioned. And so, as you can see, the amount of like truly tangible improvements Nothing have made, many of which address specific user feedback, a lot of which was from me, is really impressive. And so a big hats off to the software team at Nothing for their ongoing work. Aside from that, the issue where we don't see the animated launch icons when using third-party icon packs, that has not been fixed yet. And then honestly, in terms of just the home screen experience, the only other thing I would absolutely love for the Nothing team to implement, aside from improving the app suggestions at the top of the app drawer here, which just never seemed to be right. But aside from that, the only other change I'd love them to implement is adding support for more home screen grid sizing options. Right now, we still only have the ability to change the column amount between four and five, but if the Nothing team could let us customize both the horizontal and vertical grid sizing options, letting us go up to a minimum of at least seven by seven, if not even more, then that would make the Nothing launcher undoubtedly the best stock default home screen launcher on any phone on the market, at least in my opinion. I mean, it already supports third-party icon packs, hiding apps from the app drawer, disabling app labels natively, not to mention the fact that we can remove everything from the home screen, unlike Google Pixel phones. And so if they fixed the animated launch icon issue and added support for more grid sizing options, then I would be so, so grateful and would love their software even more than what I already do. Aside from that, pretty much everything else about this phone is almost the exact same as when I first reviewed it. I mean, the battery life is still fantastic. In fact, better than the 2A's battery life, which might be surprising given that that phone has a physically larger battery. But I think that's just testament to how good the 8 Plus Gen 1 chipset inside the Phone 2 is, because man, the battery on this phone has been great. I will say, coming from the 2A, which has a really cool evolution of a design compared to the Phone 2 and Phone 1, it has just made me more aware of how plasticky the back of the Phone 2 and Phone 1, for that matter, feels. I mean, that was one of the ways nothing brought costs down with the 2A by using plastic on the back instead of glass. But what's kind of wild to me is that although the Phone 1 and Phone 2 do have supposed glass back panels, 
from what I understand, they're actually very, very thin layers of glass, which is why they feel almost identical to the Phone 2A. It's not an issue, but for me, it's also worth noting that, you know, this phone doesn't have quite as premium a feel in the hand compared to most other premium phones on the market. I do also much prefer the center aligned camera unit on the Phone 2A for a bunch of reasons, the main of which is how it helps to prevent side to side wobble when the phone is lying flat on a table. So I hope nothing stays with that change for its next offering as well, as opposed to what we have on the Phone 2. Now, I did want to quickly mention that when this phone was first released, nothing actually sent me two review units for some reason. And whilst I had no issues with this device, which was the one that I used for the entire review period, I did end up using the second variant for the purposes of filming my various top Android app related videos and so forth. And to this day, it actually has really significant display burn in issues. It's nothing permanent, mind you, but if I leave literally anything on the screen for a few minutes, I'll then see an imprint of whatever that was for about 30 seconds following. And no software update has fixed the issue, but I also haven't really seen anyone else mentioning this issue online. So my thinking is that it's probably just a potential one-off manufacturing defect, but I did want to mention it just in case anyone else experiences it as well. And if that's the case, now you know that you're not alone. All right, real quick, let's talk about how this phone is surprisingly similar to the Phone 2A. And I'm gonna keep this quick, but for me, the display, the haptics, and the fingerprint sensor, they are all virtually indistinguishable between the two phones. But then the things I noticed were significant improvements over the 2A were that we have wireless charging, which I sorely missed when I was using the 2A. The cameras are also ever so slightly better and slightly more reliable. And I think the most noticeable improvement is that this phone is a lot better in terms of performance. Now, it's not like the phone 2A performs poorly, but within pretty much a few hours of switching back to this phone after using the phone 2A, I was struck by just how much more reliable and consistent the performance was on this phone. I'd say that the phone 2A performs like a mid-range phone, which is pretty good considering its cost, but this one performs like a true flagship, whereby it can handle pretty much anything I throw at it with ease, and there are no glitches in animations when pushing the phone a little harder than normal. And so as far as I'm concerned, that 8 Plus Gen 1 chipset really does a lot of good with the phone 2. And that's probably the differentiating factor with the cameras too. Like the camera app is just so much snappier compared to the Phone 2A, meaning it can handle fast moving objects better. It can record in 4K60 with both of the rear lenses. And to put it simply, I don't feel as great a need to resort to using a Gcam mod with this phone, which is quite different to my experience with the Phone 2A. Now, I still don't love the cameras on this phone and nothing still has a long way to go with their image processing. But again, I just think having that more powerful chipset really does work wonders with this phone. Now, with all of that being said, nine months since its launch and after a bunch of software updates, is the Nothing Phone 2 a phone that I would recommend getting right now? Well, to be honest, probably not. And that's due to a whole slew of reasons, including being potentially so close to the launch of this phone's replacement. But I also just think that there are so many other phones on the market, including the Phone 2A itself, that either offer a much more feature-rich and reliable experience, or that are just better value for money. Like the Phone 2's standout features that made it worth recommending in the first place, the design and the software, you can now get in the much more affordable Phone 2A. And so before we wrap up, I thought it'd be helpful to put together a bit of a wish list of improvements that I'd like nothing to make with the successor to this phone, which will hopefully make it a much easier recommendation. Firstly, to help distinguish the next phone further from the 2A, they've got to add a quality telephoto camera. Too long has it been now without a phone from nothing that has a telephoto lens. And so whether it's a 3X, 4X or a 5X telephoto lens, I don't care, they've got to add one. I also think they've got to switch to using larger camera sensors across the board for all of the lenses, which I think will really help in improving image quality further. But even more importantly, I think they've got to turn a lot of their attention to their camera app and camera processing. For one, let me take as many photos as I like without essentially freezing me out due to background processing. I don't care what you do to achieve this. I don't know, maybe don't start processing photos until I've left the camera app or something, but whatever the solution, this needs to be addressed. Also, you guys need to add a proper 2X cropped sensor mode like every other phone on the market has. And please, can you do something about the pretty janky lens switching? 
particularly when shooting in 4K60. The fact that we can't smoothly jump between lenses doesn't make for a great experience. And even if we use 4K30 or 1080p, there's still something just that little bit jerky in regards to the lens switching animation that we don't really see in most other premium smartphones these days. Oh, and please add support for shooting selfie videos in a resolution of at least 4K30, if not 4K60, because man, a limit of 1080p on a near flagship phone, that is not amazing. And then even just the camera app interface itself just feels a little bit half-baked. Like I know Google Pixel phones are not known for having a super speedy camera interface and their app also stops you from shooting multiple photos back to back when it's processing, but the actual interface design itself is clean and more importantly, the end results are consistently so great that the slower interface has been something we've been able to forgive. But not only is the Nothing camera app interface pretty unrefined, but the end results are also nothing really to write home about as well. Like they're okay, but they're certainly not winning any awards. And I know this is far easier said than done, but I think Nothing really does need to go all in on fixing this for their next smartphone release. Otherwise, it's gonna continue to prevent me from recommending their phones to anyone who wants a decent smartphone camera experience. Now, I acknowledge that addressing this is gonna take a heck of a lot of work, so it may not be quite achievable in time for the launch of the rumored Phone 3. So with that in mind, I've got two additional fixes that are dead easy that I also think nothing needs to address going forward. The first of which is the haptics, and this is easy. Just include a better quality haptic motor in your future phones. It's as simple as that. The quality of the haptics we've had in all of your phones up to now is just about acceptable for a budget phone, which is why I didn't complain about it in my review of the Phone 2-Way, but in a mid-range to upper-end device, now nah, these haptics do not fit. So please add a better haptic motor for your next phone. And then finally, the fingerprint sensor. And I mean, if nothing else, you've got to at least move it up higher. This was an issue that OnePlus and Xiaomi phones used to have, both of which have since been addressed in pretty much all of their latest offerings. But having the sensor that low on the display, not only does it make it awkward to reach depending on how you hold your phone, but I think because of how you have to reach for it, it actually makes it perform worse. So please, like I said, at the very least, move it up closer to the bottom third portion of the screen. But then on top of that, if you can switch to an even better quality sensor, one that's more reliable and maybe even larger, I mean, that would be the cherry on top. So cameras, the camera interface itself, haptics and the fingerprint sensor, that's it. Forget improving the glyphs, hold off from making any new home screen widgets if need be. Those are the four main areas that nothing needs to address, I think, to ensure that their lineup doesn't start becoming a sort of all flash and no substance lineup of phones. It might sound brutal, but it's only because I truly want nothing to succeed as a smartphone manufacturer. Right now, their phones all have really fun and fresh designs. They have a super refreshing and clean software experience that is a true joy to use, but not one of their phones, including the Phone 2, can compete against pretty much any flagship on the market in terms of those four features that I mentioned. And so that's it. That is my final nine month later review of the Nothing Phone 2, which is kind of turned into a look at what I think Nothing needs to do to succeed with their next smartphone release. As far as I'm concerned, whilst they've had a lot of success in this mid-range segment, I think they now need to turn their attention to that proper flagship segment so that they can have a phone in their lineup that is a serious alternative to other flagship phones on the market. Because whilst there are a lot of things that I really, really like about the Phone 2, like I mentioned earlier, it's not really a phone that I'd recommend anyone get. It's too expensive for those looking for a super affordable option, and it's lacking in too many important areas to suit the demands of those looking for a near flagship experience. But I really want that to change. I really want to be able to easily recommend a phone from nothing to just about anyone who asks. So fingers crossed that nothing finally pulls it off with the Phone 2's successor. Yeah.